This is the Central Queensland University Week 7 for Introduction to Laws 11057, Summer Term 2013-2014. And tonight's topic is a continu continuation of our discussion in relation to legal ethics. I do want to concentrate primarily on the commenting on a paper which was provided by Dean Morzone QC um, in relation to the way in which practitioners should conduct themselves in a courtroom. So it's all really about courtroom etiquette and ethical conduct in a courtroom. And um, that's the paper. Um, you can see some highlighting, but uh, that's the paper I'm referring to. All right. Now, um, before I start, does anyone have any questions about what we're going to be discussing tonight? Well, we can we can start. I'm, I'm just going to work my way through the paper and make some comments. Firstly, in reading the paper, I didn't realise how accustomed I had become to things which I take for granted, but which I can understand would be perhaps unusual. Um, and something that would things that would need to be learned if you're coming into law. In a courtroom, it, it's a very particular, almost peculiar type of um, uh, existence. Um, it's a little bit sheltered. It's it's in its own little world. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but like anywhere where there have been strong traditions built up over time, uh, there are certain things that are seen as right and certain things that are seen as wrong. And um, if you're experienced, you just, there's just certain things that you say, certain things that you do at different times that show to the court and others essentially that you know what you're doing. And there are certain traps. Some of those things are merely points of etiquette. Some things, however, are to do with, uh, are to do with ethical issues and therefore they're critically important. But it's nice, I think, to at least know how to fit in in a courtroom context so that when you're in court, uh, you feel as though you belong there and um, it's more comfortable. All right. Now, number one, I'm just going to work my way through the tips and make some comments. Number one, be prepared for court appearance. Preparation is of utmost importance. Take time to plan how you deliver your case and perform your advocacy. Now, here's the other telling point. Poor performance preparation is not only negligent, it is insulting to the court. And as part of your performance preparation, take into account the judges into idiosyncrasies, court procedures, maybe ask your colleagues. Now, um, Mr. Bolzone, QC, would, I'm sure, spend most of his time in courts, which are the higher jurisdiction. I spend most of my, my time in the Magistrates' Court um, and, if not, in the District Court. If I'm in the District Court, I will usually be briefing counsel for trials and hearings, but uh, appearing as an advocate, um, perhaps on sentencing matters or on, um, on call-over and adjournment matters. Um, so my comments will be a combination of my experience in both the Magistrates' Court and the higher courts, particularly the district court. All right, so how can we, as first year students, start to think now about how we would prepare for a court appearance? Um, I'd like you to st think in terms of, well, what if I was in a law firm and what, is I, what if I was asked to appear tomorrow? And um, start to um, develop your studies and your practices with that in mind. So creating, it's not just abstract, it, it'll be it'll be real for you. So what do we do? Um, the first thing that I should mention is that because I spend most days in the court, um, magistrates court, I I have pre-prepared folders, and in the pre-prepared folders I have a little kit. I mean, most of my work is criminal law work, and much of it is legally aided work. So in the kit I have a legal aid application ready to go. I have um, a legal aid information request, which is really a, a checklist for legal aid purposes, so that um, I'm not fumbling about and looking for those when I'm with a client who wants to apply for legal aid. I've got a people. Um, 
most clients I see in the office beforehand, so I've pre-prepared that, but occasionally they'll ask me to meet them in court, so I'll put that on hand. Now, I, the way I prepare my files, I've got a little folder, I've got a little envelope that's stapled, of course, to the inside, and in that folder, in that envelope, I've got a couple of things that I've prepared. Now, they work for me. I'm not suggesting you have to use these at all, but it might be that something similar works for you. Now, on the top is my blue sheet. It's always been blue. No particular reason. I just started with them being blue. And um, it helps because they stand out. And that court form is the pro forma that I've prepared um, for use when I'm preparing for a court hearing and for use when I'm on my feet in front of the magistrate. In my case, because I have a practice where there's a lot of if I can say low level type of crime work um, where I, I have volume of work, um, I need to be prepared to move from one file to the next quickly so that I'm not holding up the court and, uh, and of course I'm appearing to be professional and well prepared. So it may be that on a particular day, um, for example yesterday, I may have had 20 or 25 files. Um, if you have them ordered in the way that you want the day to go, but within each of those files, you have these documents prepared and um, partly they're pre-prepared. So the first one is my court appearance form number one. This is my standard form. And what I do is I have a note of the name of the client. I have some details about the charges. I have a note about the court, whether it's in the magistrate's court and which magistrate's court or which district court we're talking about. I then say appearance. Now, what is the what is the nature of the appearance um, on the particular day? So the date is up here. So what am I appearing for? And there's a number of tick boxes there. It might be that I'm appearing on what's simply called a mention. And the mention is where the court has said, um, on this particular day, I want to mention this matter uh, for no specific purpose necessarily, but to determine where we're at with the progress of the matter. Uh, now, it might be a first mention or it may be a subsequent mention. Excuse me. Um, on Friday. It is? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Preparedness. When you're in a meeting, put your phone on, do not disturb. <laughs> so it might be a mention, it may be a committal mention or a hearing mention, a committal with cross-examination, it might be a contested facts hearing, it might be a sentence hearing, it might be a call over, it might be a trial, it might be a hearing, it might be a bail application, it might be a bail variation, it could be an appeal or it might be other. Now that's, I've just rattled off a whole lot of different things, but once you get into um, some volume and once you get into the scheme of things and the running of things, um, you'll get to know what each of these different terms are if you're practicing criminal law. Just to give a brief overview, let's say someone is um, charged with an offence, they're given a very small piece of paper and notice to appear, that requires them to appear for the first mention um, in the particular court on a day at a time uh, nominated. At that first mention, um, there might be a number of things that happen. For example, it may be that um, the client wants to plead guilty there and then on the very first occasion before the court. And if it's within the jurisdiction of the court, the magistrate's court to deal with, and the magistrate is willing to deal with it there and then, the matter can be disposed of, as we, as we say. Um, Alternatively, if the matter is to be contested, we have to determine in which court the matter can ultimately be heard. So, for example, if it's a first mention on a matter involving an alleged murder, then that's not going to be ultimately dealt with by the Magistrates Court. It will be dealt with by the Supreme Court. So, um, from, even from that first mention, we start to see matters branch one way or the other. So if the matter is um, murder, if it's going to be uh, 
um, contested, uh, well, irrespective, it, it, it will need a brief of evidence. And um, that brief of evidence usually takes, for a standard matter, six to eight weeks to prepare. So the matter might be adjourned for what's called a, a, a hearing mention, oh, sorry, a committal mention or a committal call over. And uh, that will be a few weeks or six weeks down the track. So um, if we have something which is going to be dealt with in the High Court, it might be adjourned from the first mention to um, another date for a committal mention, or if it's going to be um, contested in the Magistrate's Court, instead of a mention, it, it might be adjourned for a hearing mention. So I shouldn't get too far involved in the detail, but I'll just let you know that there are a whole lot of different reasons why you might be in court. And as part of the preparation, you need to know what exactly is the purpose of the um, matter before the court on that day. Is it a mention? Is it a hearing? Is it a bail application? Is it a committal hearing? Et cetera, et cetera. So having determined that, I tick what the nature of the proceeding will be on my cheat sheet. I then have as the next column down um, a little code for what I'm seeking. And it's my, it's a code to me to remind myself as to what I want. So on that column, I have, um, I might want the QP9s, which is the, uh, the court brief prepared by police. I may want the full brief of evidence. I may want to conduct a, hear, a hand up at committal. I may want to ask for the court to excuse the attendance of my client in person on that day. I may wish to withdraw. I may want to ask the court for leave to withdraw. I may want to adjourn the matter or something else. So you can see that firstly I've identified the name of the client, the nature of the proceedings, um, and um, and then what it is that I'm, I'm going to ask for so that I'm not fumbling about when the magistrate says, yes, in relation to this matter of blog, what's happening today, I can say, uh, matter set down for committal mention, and I propose, I have instructions to proceed by way of full hand up committal, for example. Um, but don't worry too much about what these terms mean, but the point is that you've pre prepared by having it clearly noted for yourself in a way that makes sense to you what it is that you're going to ask the court for on that day. The next part of my little sheet, I have a notation of who's on the bench, who's the prosecutor, is there a barrister, is there a representative of the Department of Child Safety or Department of Youth Justice, and I've got some names printed in there from the, for the ones that are um, most common, and I'll then just go through and tick uh, this magistrate, this prosecutor, this member from probation, parole, etc. I'll then go on to procedure, what is actually what's happened. So the first one is guilty plea accepted. So if we enter the plea of guilty or the client enters the plea of guilty um, and the magistrate accepts the plea of guilty, I will then tick that box. But it might be some other things that have occurred. Um, I'll then talk about the election of jurisdiction. I've mentioned this briefly before. So if, for example, the matter is a matter that um, may be dealt with in the Magistrates Court or may be dealt with in the District Court, someone has to make an election at some stage as to which way we go. And the um, legislation provides that in some circumstances that election can be made by the prosecutor. In other circumstances, the election can be made by the Defence Counsel. So, there's provision in this form built in to say, all right, who's made the election and, and what election has been made? Is the matter proceeding by way of indictment in the district court or is the matter proceeding summarily in the magistrate's court? And, and um, I then tick those, those forms. The next thing is um, uh, if there's an adjournment, I make a note here of um, the adjournment details to the Magistrates Court at such and such on such and such a date. I then have provision for bail, whether bail was refused, granted, um, if granted, was it on an own undertaking or on conditions, 
was the ban in favour um, to the to appear in the district court, um, or conversely, was bail forfeited? Was it revoked? Has a warrant issued, etc. Um, and then I sign off down the bottom with a few more things. So sorry, that's a lot to take in. The point of that exercise is really not to um, bog you down too much in criminal law procedure and criminal law terms, but it's twofold. The first is that you do need to prepare and prepare in a way that makes sense to you. This makes sense to me, but it may not make sense to you. Um, and the second is get to know some of the basic terms so that right from the outset you can establish credibility with the court, with the client and with the gallery, um, those people that are there, whether they're fellow practitioners or members of the public or members of the press, etc. So having that type of preparation um, will help considerably. So I have my blue forms and below the blue forms I have what's called, and I, this is just something I've prepared, um, it's a client instruction sheet. There are dozens and dozens of different versions of this, but um, uh, on this particular form I've got a little summary of, of legal aid funding and I've got a little summary of um, um, the court dates and what's happened in various court dates. So I can, and I use codes, M for mention, HM for hearing mention, etc. And over on this side, I just have a list of the things that have, have been done on the farm, particularly letters and documents. So, and I have those coded as well. So at a glance, on the first page of this form, I can see what court appearances and for what purposes and when and what correspondence has been prepared and what type of funding arrangements we have, whether it's legal aid or not. And if it is legal aid, the details of the grant of legal aid. So that works for me. Inside, I then have quite a few pages for taking down notes and um, when I'm interviewing clients, I uh, always interview the clients by inserting material in the same place so that when I'm on my feet in front of the court, I'll have the blue forms, gives me an idea of what the matter's about. I then go to the client instruction sheet and the client's version, is essentially what the client is telling me, and what I think is important to convey to the court is recorded here and that runs for maybe four or five pages. After that, I have some prepared material, which again is designed to ensure that I'm doing the best job I can in front of the court. And this particular page is called antecedents. Antecedents is just simply a term that means some significant aspects of the um, person's background that is important to um, uh, record and uh, to note. And because it's in the same place, I get used to being able to identify here is where I'll make comments in relation to mental health or here is where I'll make comments in relation to previous criminal activity, etc. Um, again, you don't have to use this form. Any form will do. But it's a matter of being prepared and ready and able to speak off the cuff but by having reference to notes. Um, you don't want to be reading material word for word. I'm not unless you're a prosecutor. They, they can get away with that sometimes. Um, this next page, I have reproduced the Penalties and Sentences Act. And the reason I do that is it's a reminder to me of the principles that um, are important for a court to consider on sentencing. Sentencing means passing the judgment. It doesn't necessarily mean jail. But jail is one option for us. Um, so if I'm, for example, arguing on behalf of um, a young person who's been charged with burglary, then there might be some aspects of this case that I need to highlight to um, get the best result for my client. And this is an extract of um, Section 9 of the Penalties and Sentences Act of 1992. That's a very important section when it comes to sentencing principles um, and it, it basically outlines the 
purposes for which people um, should be sentenced or how a sentence should be imposed, what are the general principles, and then what are the things that a court must consider and have regard to when imposing sentence. So, for example, um, the sixth one down is the offender's character, age and intellectual capacity. So, in those circumstances, I might be wanting, uh, I may want to stress the um, youth of, of the client and uh, argue that uh, the youth of the client is a significant matter in sentence that needs to be considered by the court um, and the judgment should reflect that accordingly. So I have those notes, but they're twofold. Firstly, when I'm taking instructions from the client, I always go to that page and while the client's there, I, I quickly glance down that and I might highlight some words that I think are particularly important that need to be stressed. And then, of course, when I'm on my feet, I can see the highlighting, and that's the prompt to remind me to argue those points in front of the court. Um, below that, I have a few very basic um, information pieces about case law. Um, I have um, a page that deals with sentencing options. So I might go through that and tick that in this particular case, I'm going to be argued for um, an intensive correction order. I might have determined that that's the appropriate sentence um, as opposed to actual imprisonment and I might um, highlight that, stress that in front of the court and then try to back that up with reasons why that should be the appropriate order in the particular circumstances of the case uh, in question. Then I have some material about uh, court-ordered release, parole, some commentaries, some information about bail what are the important aspects for consideration on the bail application um, and uh, make some notes there. And finally, have um, some pro formas in terms of um, pleading guilty or not guilty and all the other bits and pieces that you need written instructions for on the way through. So if, for example, your client says, um, I'm in custody, I would like you to make an application for bail. I have a little sheet here, a little section, where I invite the client to provide written instructions. And I think that's always very important. It covers you in the event of some problems down the track, but also it makes it clear that the client is committing to something which is important. So, for example, I may say to a client, you can apply for bail today, but I would advise against it. I think you should spend some time in custody for whatever reason and consider applying for bail later. If the client says, no, I want to apply for bail today, you would have them sign, but it prompts you to remind them that if they apply for bail in the magistrate's court and they're unsuccessful, they can't apply again in the magistrate's court unless their circumstances have changed substantially. And um, if they're rejected in the magistrate's court, they then have to go to the Supreme Court to apply for bail. So it's just a reminder and it's a way of covering it. It's all part of preparation. Um, and there are other things in here as well, which um, I, I won't go into. So do you understand the importance of preparation? Now, yeah. You might say, well, if, if I'm in a general practice and I'm expected to appear before a court on family law on Monday, a criminal law matter on Tuesday, um, an industrial matter on Wednesday, a debt collection matter on Thursday, an enforcement hearing, how am I supposed to have all these enforcement, all these forms? Um, some parts can be generic, some parts. Um, you know, uh, you can use no matter what. But, um, and many, many firms have their own version of these for different areas. So I've got different forms for, for different areas, but I've just selected the criminal law ones that I've used there. All right, that's a very long commentary on the very first point of Dean Law's own paper, I'm sorry. But the point no, it's is to be, to be prepared. Um, also, I think it's valuable to have printed the relevant parts of the legislation and some cases if you're intending to rely on cases. So if, for example, to come back to the example of 
bail application, you're instructed to apply for bail, you might have um, the Bail Act with you, or maybe an extract of the Bail Act. If you're arguing that bail should be granted because you've come across a similar case, and in that case there were some general principles which you think should be um, um, urged upon the court, then you might have that case available so that the court can see the case. Uh, you'd have a, a copy of that case for the prosecutor as well. So in other words, you, you're not um, simply referring to a case in isolation of having the case presented to the court as well as part of your argument. All right, so that's the first part of the preparation. Um, any questions or comments about what I've said so far? No. That's okay? All right. Number two, be punctual and arrive on time. Uh, make sure you get there well before a hearing. Have your appearance slip prepared or noted. In the magistrate's court, we don't use appearance slips, although we can, and maybe sometimes we do, but generally we don't. In the higher courts, we generally do, and an appearance slip is a pro forma, and your responsibility is that you find this appearance slip, you complete the appearance slip, and you hand it to typically the bailiff, but it, it might be the judge's associate as well, um, and it basically identifies in simple terms the case that you're um, intending to appear on, your name, your qualification for the barrister or solicitor, um, if you're a solicitor, who you work for, and uh, if you're in, engaging a barrister, the name of the barrister um, also is inserted on the form. So it just gives the judge an idea of who you are and why you're there and where you're from um, before you start the proceedings. So that's an appearance slip. Um, give that to the judge's associate. Can I just say, it's always um, a good idea if possible, to have an email and phone number available to get through to the court, whether it's the magistrate's court or the district court, um, in case you need to communicate with the court. Now, I need to be careful about how I say this because it is inappropriate, in my view, generally speaking, um, possibly always, to communicate with the court in relation to a matter without also involving your opponent in the discussions. In a criminal law context, for example, you intend to ask the court to consider bail on a certain date, then if you're writing to the court to ask for, um, for that to be noted, then you would CC prosecution with that information. But um, I think it's always a good idea to have the in, say, the judge's um, situation in the district court, if you have the judge's associate's name and phone number and email address, preferably, that way, if there's some problem or you need to communicate with the judge, you've got an avenue of doing so. Uh, you should never attempt to communicate directly with the judge or the magistrate, as the case may be. Um, certainly not, uh, unless you're invited to do so. Um, and, and so they're not without the prior knowledge and perhaps invitation of the other party to, uh, to do so. All right, number three, be ready. Know the courtroom and the time you met us to be called and be ready to go. Be nearby and alert to the call of your case by a court officer or associate. If the hearing is, is in open court, then you can sit inside the public gallery, ready to move to the bar table when ready. Have your papers ready, tabbed and accessible so that they can be placed on the bar table quickly, quietly and efficiently. You do want to be cool, calm and collected um, when you approach the bar table. You want to be well organised and importantly, if the judge or the magistrate is moving from one matter directly onto yours without a break, there will be an expectation that you'll be ready to talk immediately. So there's usually limited time available to you in a practical sense 
before, between the time that you're moving to the bar table and the time that you're expected to address the court. So you need to be well organised and have your papers ready. Um, and that way you'll enjoy the process more as well. When we talk in terms of open court and closed court, what that means is this. Open court is open for the general public. A closed court is available for the participants only and members of the general public are not able to sit in and they can't hear those things. So um, examples of closed court proceedings typically are children's court proceedings and domestic violence court proceedings. They are typically closed court, but they're not the only examples of closed court proceedings. And um, you'll often see that if you go to a courtroom, if you look up above the door, you'll see um, illuminated the sign court, which indicates that the court is in session, and you'll either see open or closed. If it's open, that means that even if it's in session, you can um, go politely and quietly enter the courtroom. But if it's closed, you're not allowed to go in. Um, if you do go into a, a courtroom which is in session, the accepted and necessary protocol is that as you have made your way into the room, um, that you stop, uh, you respectfully bow and uh, move on. Uh, not a full bow, you don't, don't go down to you know, horizontal, uh, it's, it's really just a matter of um, acknowledging the court um, and then moving on. All right, no questions so far? Good. <clears throat> so there no questions there? No. no. All right, now clean and tidy um, appearance. Just be um, careful when it comes to appearance and dress, which is four and five, you should always wear a jacket. Um, so it's certainly for, for women, you don't have to wear a suit. For men, that's the generally accepted practice. Um, but always wear a jacket, uh, certainly in the higher courts. In um, the District Supreme and other courts of the higher jurisdiction, the court may not hear your matter if you're not dressed appropriately. Um, so you've got to wear a jacket. <laughs> um, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I heard anecdotally of a person who appeared at the at the bar table before a, a judge um, announced the appearance. The judge said, I cannot hear you, Mr. or Ms. Bloggs. Um, so that person spoke more loudly. What the judge was saying is, I can't hear you because you're not wearing a coat. I'm not. So you have to go away, get a coat and come back and then I will hear you. So that's just one of the little idiosyncrasies. In the magistrate's court, it's not a requirement that you wear a jacket, but I think it's better that you do. Um, I must confess that during the, the heat of summer, the middle of summer, I will often not wear a, a jacket, but uh, almost always I will wear a jacket. And I think it's a sign of respect. If you're in the higher courts, you must have a jacket. So part of your preparation is make sure that you have your jacket accessible and ready. And you've got to work that out for yourself. It may be that your protocol, your practice, is to always leave a jacket at work, no matter what. It's just always there. It might be that you always wear a jacket to work, whether you're going to court or not. You always wear a jacket. But what you want to do is avoid a situation where, you know, during your first week in the law firm, one of the partners says, I'm stuck, I can't go down to brief counsel in the Supreme Court, I need you to go. Um, there's an expectation that you'll have your jacket ready uh, and, and be there. So just uh, do whatever it takes to ensure that you're pretty, sorry, you're prepared and ready to um, uh, get, get there uh, in time. Uh, I have another little practice. I always leave a spare tie in my car. Um, I always leave a jacket here at work. When you enter the courtroom, you've got to ensure that you don't commit some cardinal errors. I've talked about wearing a coat and for men wearing a tie. But um, 
you, you're not allowed to have sunglasses on your head. You know, people walk in from um, outside, pop their sunglasses on their head, forget that they're there, walk into a courtroom. If you start to address a judge with the sunglasses in your head, uh, you can expect a quick response. It's not, not a nice one. <laughs> so you've got to, you've got to do that. Um, definitely make sure your phone doesn't ring during court proceedings, especially at the bar table, but any time that you're in the courtroom. I do a little, I do a little pat down dance before I walk into a courtroom every time, and it's it's sort of that. Make sure there's nothing on my head. Make sure I've got my keys and my phone um, and glasses if I'm wearing glasses, and I always check the phone before I go in. Make sure it's either off or, in my case, I put it on silent. Um, so there's that little dance at the doorway to make sure that everything's in order. That's all part of good preparation. Make sure your phone is off. Um, number seven. Oh, and also, this is, and this is, I know this sounds very basic, but make sure you go to the toilet. Have a toilet break before you go into court. Um, you don't want to be obviously uncomfortable while you're on the, on your feet and having to ask for a break when you're an hour into uh, the court case. Now, you're all responsible for advising clients, witnesses and associates about proper corporate etiquette and behaviour. So whenever I take my clients or witnesses through, I will ask them to follow the same rules that I've followed. Sunglasses off, phone off, make sure you're dressed appropriately and move in. Um, witnesses, clients, etc., they don't have to wear coats. That rule only applies to us as practitioners. Having said that, I think it's always a good idea that uh, clients um, are well dressed and respectfully dressed, particularly if they are defendants. Uh, number eight, no eating or chewing. Number nine, provide an order of witnesses or glossary terms. Uh, that's an interesting comment that um, Mr. Morzone has given me. Give the associate a list of the full names of witnesses and technical terms that may be used by expert witnesses. And I guess that's just so that the judge can get his or her head around those technical terms that might be dandied around in the, in the case in question. I recall during a five-day hearing last year in relation to um, the computer technology and uh, there were so many uh, technical terms that I had to become familiar with that um, it would have been, I didn't, but it would have been useful to have had a glossary of those terms written down. So I think that's a very good um, suggestion that uh, Mr. Morzone has made. Number 10, be honourable, candid and trustworthy when dealing with your opponent. Um, advocates work cooperatively and dependently in the presentation of the case. Now, for those of people, those people not in the profession, that may come as a surprise. It's not perhaps as it's portrayed in TV on many occasions. Advocates are generally very polite to each other, and I think that's the way it works best. That's not always the case, and I'm not going to be critical of practitioners who um, are robust in the way they approach their time in court. Um, it's not what I prefer to do, and I think most practitioners um, are really quite cooperative and polite with their opponents, and I think that's the way to go. Now, when you go into court, be aware that the courtroom will be live, and any comments may be digitally recorded. By that I mean um, there are very sensitive microphones in court, and even if the judge or magistrate is not presiding at the time, be aware that everything that's being said is being recorded. It may not ever go beyond the recording, but it can be it can be noted. So just be careful what you're saying in a courtroom um, sense. Now, number 12, as you walk in, bow respectfully. I've already talked about that. Uh, it's not a full blown, you don't, what does he say? It's neither amusing nor respectful to bow too low and deep or quick and shallow. It's got to be golly locks just right. Little bit of idiosyncrasy. When you're waiting, just be respectful, don't be too noisy, and be aware the judge can see you and hear you. 
Now, number 14, seniority. Um, there are two aspects to seniority. The first is that seniority will affect order that the matters are dealt with. Uh, in other words, barristers go before solicitors, solicitors go before privately represented people, um, or sorry, um, self-represented. And within barristers, QCs or senior counsel go before all other barristers, which we call junior counsel. And uh, within within the ranks of QCs or junior barristers or solicitors, within those ranks, uh, whoever was admitted first is regarded as the more senior. They have the right to go first in court. So um, in, in my area, being quite a senior solicitor, I will generally go, if I want to, uh, towards the start of the proceedings. But if there is a barrister, even though that barrister may have been admitted last month, they are re regarded as more senior to me, and they have the right to go first if they choose to go. So that's what seniority means. So that's the first thing, the order of the presentation. The second is that seniority at the bar table, if you've got a number of lawyers, is determined uh, so that uh, at the bar table, seniority is from right to left. So the more senior um, practitioner will be on the right. Now there is an exception to that generally in criminal law proceedings. Prosecution mostly are on the right hand side of the bar table as you walk in. Defence is mostly on the left hand side of the bar table. Um, but in some courtrooms that, that's swapped around. Right, no questions about what I've said so far? Seniority? No. Okay. Right. The judge is the main focal point. Um, rise immediately when the judge enters and leaves. Remain silent and complete attention until the judge takes his or her place and bow and do not sit down until the judge is seated. It might, be, it might seem obvious things, but they are important little convention rules and they're all designed to show um, for um, to ensure that you're showing appropriate respect to the judge. Number 16, get off to a good start. First impressions. And I like this comment. It may take three seconds for the judge to evaluate you, your instructor and your client. So first impressions are really important. And that's why I do say it's important to have your paperwork ready be mentally prepared and um, be um, uh, focused on what you intend to say. But having said that, it doesn't have to be an overly serious place. Um, it's okay to smile in court. Sometimes it's good. And it's okay to have a little bit of acting skill when it comes to court. You want to be there to enjoy it. It's, it's not just a job. Um, which therefore must mean that it's not enjoyable. And um, I think most good advocates really enjoy the process of being in court. They enjoy having the opportunity and the privilege of being able to present a case and represent a client and um, have the privilege of being able to, to present their case in front of a magistrate or a judge. So treat it as a privilege and something that's very enjoyable um, and something that, uh, that you want to do and be happy about it. Um, and all of that is um, part of that first impression. Now, number 17 is announce your appearance. Um, there are certain protocols. So a solicitor might say, um, for example, may it please the court, my name is whatever, surname, initials, say them. Solicitor of whatever practice and I appear for um, the defendant logs. So there's a little protocol that goes with it. So in my case, I might say, um, well, mate, in relation to the matter of Joe Logs, my name is Milburn, uh, M I L B U R N, initials J A, sort of spirit Milburn's law, and go on from there. So I might then say, uh, I know that my client is charged with one count of grievous bodily harm and one count of uh, trespass. I take those charges as read, and my instructions are as follows, and then, and then you're into it. 
So just practice that little bit of a blurb at the start so that you're familiar with that um, and you remember that you must announce your appearance when you get to the bar table. So that's important. If you go to the bar table and you simply start arguing, well, I'm here because of this client who wants bail, uh, very quickly the court will say, well, hang on, um, please announce your appearance, uh, which is where you've got to say, well, essentially, here's who I am and here's who I represent. All right. Number um, 18, be organised at the bar table. We've talked about that. Number 19, um, be respectful. When you're talking to the court, you don't say, in a courtroom context, you don't say judge. You might recall that we talked about being in a social context where if you're meeting a district court judge or Supreme Court judge, the, um, the usual protocol um, is to say um, judge. So there's nothing at all wrong in a social context. But say you're going to the um, law, Queensland Law Society Symposium and you happen to be introduced to a district court judge, uh, enjoy the process, don't be overawed by it, um, but, uh, but say, refer to the judge as judge. So, nice to meet you, judge, or good morning, judge. But in court, we say, Your Honour. Uh, we don't ever use the term judge. And we never talk, and this is an interesting little bit of protocol, we don't talk in the second person, we talk in the third person. So, if, for example, um, we got to one o'clock and you notice the time and you're about to start with another witness, um, you, you might say something like, Your Honour, would this be a convenient time to break for lunch? So you don't say, do you want to break for lunch? You say, would Your Honour uh, wish to break for lunch? That type of thing. And if you're reminding the court of something that had been said previously, you don't say, well, as you said a moment ago, you said, as Your Honour said, um, blah, blah, blah. So you talk in the third person when you're um, speaking to a judge in the court. You direct all submissions and remarks to the bench and not the opposing advocate. So everything goes through the judge. Um, there's no, well, there shouldn't be private discussions between the parties. Having said that, it does happen often. And in some circumstances, it's, it's quite okay. I'll just try and explain that. If, for example, um, in a criminal law proceeding, there's some dispute as to the jurisdiction, whether this is a matter that should be dealt in the magistrate's court or the district court, for example, there's nothing really wrong with very politely excusing yourself for the court. Um, excuse me, Your Honour, if, if I could just take a moment and then lean over to your opponent and say, look, I think this has got to go to the district court. What do you think? And, and a quick conference will take place, very quick, in which case you then come back and say, um, sorry, Your Honour, thank you very much for allowing us that indulgence. Um, we are agreed that this is a matter that ought to be uh, dealt with in the district court, if Your Honour is um, minded to do so, for example. So generally speaking, if you're in open court and you're arguing the case, Everything is through the judge, but sometimes you can have private little discussions with the other side if it's polite and the judge is as given essentially permission to do that. No questions so far? Thank you. Um, number 20, be uncompromisingly ethical in everything that you do. You're required to be very candid and diligent. Um, know your ethical guidelines and your rules. Um, in the new lawyer, those rules are referred to in Chapter 13, and in particular, um, pages 460, where there's um, some very good commentary in relation to the um, Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, which apply in Queensland, um, and also some comments in relation to Services Commission, and your obligations to a court. Um, which uh, are mirrored to some degree in the commentaries that we're reading from um, Dean Morse. Number 21, remain truly a paramount duty to the court and administration of justice. Don't lead the court into error. 
important example of that is, is this. Let's say you've done some research, you've found one case that is wonderfully supportive of your position, you found another case that's not so so good, you can't just rely on the one case and ignore the other case. You do need to provide some balance. Um, and you don't want to lead the court into error by the court believing, from what you're saying, that there is only one real case that is relevant to this area and one way that this can be looked at. So you do need to be careful um, and you've also got to correct mistakes if there are obvious mistakes, even, that, even if that is contrary to your client's interests. All right, now, um, number 25, John, can I? Yeah. Sorry, John, can I interrupt? Sorry. All right, Mark, I had to set a question before we go to 25. We're for number 24 mm. about if the judge makes an accidental slip or obvious omission. Yes. I, I don't really understand what they're saying about that. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, let me try to think of an example. Okay, um, let's say that you've got a client who's been charged with stealing and it's in a sentencing situation and the court makes a comment, um, something to the effect, well, this is a charge which carries a maximum of 12 months imprisonment. Now, if you know that that's not correct, um, very politely and carefully, you might want to bring that um, accidental slip to the attention of the court by saying, well, uh, Your Honour, um, I note that uh, the provision um, allows for a maximum penalty of seven years. But you've just got to be a bit careful or um, uh, respectful about that. Or it might be a factual slip. It might be um, um, something like, um, well, I'm prepared to grant this person bail because um, they've been in the same residence for 10 years. Um, if that's not the case, if, if the material says otherwise and they've only been in that residence for one year and the judge has, or the magistrate has made a mistake, um, then you might want to correct the magistrate, particularly if that's an important thing, uh, and just bring that to the court's attention. Um, or if there's been some sort of obvious omission, um, I hope that answers your question, Jackie. Yeah, just when I, that, thanks, John. Just because when I read it, it said you may only and politely draw the court's attention to a slip or error in the decision, and then it says to avoid the need to apply the slip rule. Oh, the slip so I, was getting, no, I was getting confused with that. Yeah, so the slip rule is if um, there has been this obvious mistake, um, then the, the matter uh, can be corrected through the, the slip rule, um, which would like on review of the decision or um, reopening the proceedings at some stage. Thank you. All right. Well, we are getting very close to having spent probably enough time, but I'm looking through the rest to see um, what I'd like to, uh, to talk about. Yes, 26 and 27 talk about interactions with the judge or the magistrate, and that is that you're, you don't argue with the court but you present arguments to the court. Um, you also don't offer your opinion to the court. You offer your submission to the court. Now, there are some little subtle differences. For example, your submission might be that it would be advantageous for the young man that you're representing to be released on bail because it would provide um, a benefit to the community to have this person out working rather than in prison. So you might say, um, in my submission, if granted bail, there would be a benefit to the community because of these reasons. What you don't say is in your opinion. And it might seem a slightly subtle wording change, but you don't say, in my opinion, it would be better if this person is working rather than being in, in, in prison. You see that subtle difference? On the one hand, you're making the submission. My submission, for your consideration, Your Honour, is this. Yeah, that's fine. You don't say, my opinion is this. 
the judge isn't interested in your opinion. Um, so the submission is more the submission is more a formal, like legally researched type of thing. The opinion is just what you think. So that's a, the difference there, isn't it? And it might be exactly yeah. the same thing, um, using different words. It might be the same yeah. concept, but it is important that you make submissions. You don't offer your opinion, and sometimes you just use the words. You don't you don't use the word you don't use the words the phrase in my opinion ever in the courtroom. It's always my, you know, uh, as Dean Rosone says, in my respectful submission, Your Honour, the evidence is otherwise. You don't say you are wrong. You don't argue with the court. Um, so you can't be rude, um, and you don't you don't tell the court what to do. Now courts don't mind in some instances being guided, and they can be quite receptive to that. But you don't um, you don't tell the judge what to do or the magistrate what to do. Um, for example, if you know that following sentence, um, the passing of sentence, there should be some discussion about whether a conviction should be recorded or not. At the end of the proceedings, if the magistrate has passed sentence but not raised or not dealt with that issue, you might think it, it should be dealt with. Um, you don't stand up and say, Your Honour, you should now consider whether to, to record a conviction or not. What you would do is you might stand up and say, is your honour proposing to consider the arguments regarding recording the conviction or not? So you see the subtle difference? Not telling them, but you're inviting them to consider it. Um, now, all right, now let's see. Oh, yes, 28 is make your submission, don't proffer your opinion or comment. So you never use the words I think are in my view. Number 30, use good plain English, and I seem to be stretching this example this course. It really is a wonderful movement, but even though I think we have these lovely, polite and quaint and um, really very nice rules of etiquette and uh, protocol in court, we still use plain English. Um, we don't want a situation where people are using um, large words purely for the sake of it. Um, it. It really is intended to be a place where we can communicate and people can understand what we're saying. So um, don't, uh, don't use the technical um, words or the, uh, the pompous words if, if uh, possible. Number 31 is a very good comment. It says, um, look, be calm, polite, credible, um, but don't be a slouch. Um, don't put on a pompous plum in the mouth act. We don't really, you don't see that very often, and when you do now, it looks a bit strange. Um, be calm and confident, and as I said, just enjoy the process, but don't be, um, uh, you know, too casual. So don't thirty-two. Um, don't put a foot on the chair and break yourself across the lectern. That just looks. Um, horrible. I cringe when I see the occasional advocate do that. Be, um, you know, stand straight, um, be respectful, and um, uh, you know, as it, uh, it, Dean Wilson says, lose the theatrics. I slightly disagree with that a bit because I think there is some room for acting, um, but it's not you know an over the top matter. It's a, a subtle thing. All right. Um, then 36, set up straight with good posture, move papers and take notes quickly in 38, and remain in attendance until excused. So the bar table should never be left unoccupied when court is in the session. So if your matter is finished, you actually um, need to excuse yourself, a bit like the old fashioned may I be excused from the table um, at dinner. It's a bit like that in court. So when you've finished your matter, um, you might finish with something like, that is my uh, final matter, or that is my only matter, Your Honour. Uh, might I be, might I be excused? Or, yes, you, you may be excused, but you've got to ask for that um, permission. Um, don't just walk off. Now, be careful. If um, 
no one else is coming to take your place and the other party has gone, and you're the only party at the bar table in front of the judge in an open court, you really shouldn't leave your post. You've got to stand by your post until somebody else is ready to relieve you. That is unless the court specifically says that, um, that you may leave the bar table unattended or words to that effect. Okay? So little things that really do make a difference. And if you're practising in court, you really come to enjoy these little protocols. Um, lovely little exchange between you and the court sometimes. Um, and the court's appreciate it if you show them those courtesies and you follow those little rules. Um, number 45 is know how to manage your conflicting diary obligations. I have a special form, I haven't got it with me at the moment, but I, I always have a form that I call Court Availability Notes and that gives me an idea of on one side dates where I'm not available and on the other side dates that I'm available that I can work in with. So it might be, for example, on the left hand side I've got an entry to say look, I've got to be in Brisbane on this day and I can't get out of it. On the other hand, you might have all the dates that you're in court, in the particular court that you're in. Uh, let's say it might be on a particular day you've got a hearing of the matter. Now, the difference is this. If, for example, um, there's a bail application that needs to be adjourned to another date, and the magistrate suggests a certain date, Quickly glance down the left-hand side, and if it clashes, you say, "I'm sorry, Your Honour, I'm not available that day. I am in Brisbane." Court appreciate the court will appreciate it, and will almost always simply find you another day. On the other side, you might have some dates that you really think will be good. It'll work in well with your diary. It might be that you're in court on that day for another matter, and you know this matter is only going to take 15 minutes. So you might politely say, um, "Your Honour, might I?" Might I suggest, or might I kind of suggest, but um, would it be suitable for this matter to be dealt with on such and such date? I'm in this court for another matter. And the court might say, yes, happy to work in with you and nominate the date. So just be aware of your diary because if something is committed and then you go back to the office and then you find it's a clash, it's really stressful to then think, well, what am I going to do? I've now created a conflict from a situation. I wish I'd told the magistrate there and then that I'm not available. It'd save you so much work. All right. Um, and I think that's probably all I want to talk about in terms of that excellent paper. And that's probably all I want to talk about in terms of Chapter 13 being ethical. Um, I will direct your attention to pages 460 and 461. Um, which I think are very important, and page 467, the ethics of care over other approaches. So perhaps that can be for some fun. Now, I'm sorry that I've gone so long tonight. I, again, I feel like I'm doing too much talking. I hope I haven't given too much information. Now, do you have any questions for me? I just have a, a simple general question, John. In the time that you've been in practice, has the, um, has the courtroom etiquette changed at all? Has there been any major changes or has it pretty much been the same way? It's probably pretty much been the same way. My interaction with the court has changed as I've become more senior. Um, and again, there's sort of an unwritten rule that if you are relatively junior in the profession, it is a case of um, not being too outspoken, unless you're arguing a case, then you'd be vigorous and you'd be determined, etc. Um, but if you're a little more senior and they're used to seeing you pretty much every day, you've just got a little bit more licence to be, just um, a bit, have a bit more interaction. But uh, no, generally speaking, the way in which we do things now is very similar to how it was in the early 80s when I first started. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you. Rachel, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I'd just like to know a little bit more about um, how the seniority uh, affects things. Like, is it just a protocol or does it have an impact on your client? 
it is um, really just a protocol, but it can have a practical effect on your client. If, for example, you have a client who um, is appearing on a busy day where there are maybe 30 or 40 different matters being mentioned at 9.30, um, if you know that there are a number of matters and you accept that you're going to be junior, you might want to warn your client that there could be a wait. Um, and uh, if the client is, is anxious to get out of, uh, out of there by 10 and they're still there at 2 because of other matters where more senior practitioners are uh, going ahead of you, uh, the client won't be too happy with you unless you've warned them to that effect. The other thing, though, is that um, many of the senior practitioners will be very happy for more junior practitioners to go first, particularly if what the junior practitioner wants to do is something quite quick. So, for example, if I'm down in court all day and I've got a hearing as well as a few mentions, um, if another practitioner, um, a junior practitioner, says, look, I, I just have two mentions and then I'm, I'm finished, I'm, I'll say, well, please go first. Um, so you can, you can do that as well. But um, yeah, so seniority is a rule of protocol, but it can have an effect on your clients because of the order of the things are dealt with. The other thing too is that if a court lists, for example, two hearings on the one day and both matters are to proceed, then there is a risk that your client's hearing matter will be bumped to another day. Um, so you know, you've been told on this particular day the, the, the trial will proceed, you've got to alert your clients to the fact that um, things can change. Courts are busy places and they often double or triple book for valuable resources. So you've just got to be careful um, to ensure that um, um, they're aware of that, otherwise they'll be upset with you. So that, and that's where seniority can come in, in that the court may say, well, look, I've got two matters. Both are listed for 9.30 to start. I can't hear both matters at the one time. I propose to proceed with this matter because um, we've got more senior lawyers involved in it. For example, magistrates always make the decision or judges always make the decision, but that might be one of the factors as to uh, uh, which one gets to go on first. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Any other questions, Rachel? No. Okay. That's fine. All right, well, we might wrap it up fairly soon. Jackie, is there anything else that you'd like to ask mm. or comment upon? No, it's all good. Thanks very much, John. All right. If you haven't spent time in a courtroom, I do urge you to go in and have a look at a courtroom and uh, just get a feel for it. And some of the things that you've read about in that paper and in, and in Chapter 13 in particular, um, it won't take too long before you see those things in practice. And uh, just enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. All right. Well, we'll finish the recording now. Um, can I just say there'll be no, um, this will be our last one for a while, I should think. Uh, we won't be meeting on Christmas Eve, and I shouldn't think we'd be meeting on New Year's Eve as well. So more than likely, uh, the next Tuesday session will be the first Tuesday um, in January um, once we get into it. Is that okay? All right. It's perfect. Okay. Thank you. And um, Thank you. all the best for Christmas. You too, John. Be safe. Thank you. So, Rachel. Bye. Bye.